Hello there, this is John, and this is the Perilingual Airway Adjunct Lecture. So as of spring of 2023, uh, this device right here, the King Airway, is the only airway that EMTs can insert on standing order in the County of San Diego. Uh, that's going to be changing here uh, July 1st. My understanding is that they're going to be adopting a new airway, and it's called the iGel. Uh, it's a simpler device to use. The only thing is, is that they have not, the county has not yet approved this for EMT use. They're talking about it right now. It's probably going to happen in the next six or eight months or so. So I just want to give you a heads up. If you are working as an EMT in the future here in the county, you might see this device out there. And if you are working, your agency that you're working for will train you on the use of this, this particular device. So these devices, along with other ones on the market as well, are all considered these perilaryngeal airways, or you can call them advanced airways if you like. They all have pretty much the same advantages. So primarily you can perform a blind insertion. You don't have to see where this device goes. The way it's designed, the way you, you insert it correctly, it's gonna go where it needs to go probably 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, majority of these, these devices are designed to go into the esophagus. Now, it kind of sounds counterintuitive. You think you'd want to ventilate the trachea, but you are actually ventilating the trachea indirectly because these, the King Airway device in particular, it seals the esophagus. You inflate the balloons, which seal the oral pharynx, which seals the nose and mouth. You ventilate through the tube and air comes out the tube and goes into the trachea and thereby causing the chest to rise and fall. Now the advantages to this is you've taken away that whole mask issue with the bag valve mask. There's no longer the CE grip issue. There's no longer the I can't get a good seal issue. There's no longer all that blow by and stuff going on with this because you, you've taken away that mask problem and now your seals are internal. They're inside the person's mouth essentially. This increases your effectiveness of your, of your ventilations dramatically. You need an actual less volume of air to cause the patient's chest to rise and fall properly. Uh, and it's much more easily, uh, patients are much more easily ventilated. And because the esophagus is blocked and the oral pharynx is blocked, vomitus can't get into the airway, blood can't get into the airway, secretions are blocked as well. And of course, if you are by some, you know, means overventilating, there's, there's also, there's no risk of maybe having gastric extension develop because the esophagus is blocked, the air can't get down into the stomach. Now, because these devices are so effective and, and efficient, uh, it, they actually change the way we perform CPR. Now, you've already learned about the 10 to one ratio and you know, 10 compressions to one ventilation. Once you've inserted an advanced airway and it's properly placed and you're ventilating through it, we no longer follow a ratio. Basically, we have continuous quality compressions, about 110 per minute, the same depth, the same full recoil, everything you've already learned. The difference is, is we no longer stop to allow the person to ventilate. The person ventilating, all they're doing is every six seconds, they're just squeezing the bag and because these devices are so effective and so efficient, uh, we can breathe right through those compressions and provide this patient with the needed oxygen. Indications are exactly the same as you would use a bag valve mask with an oral pharyngeal airway. Um, again, no gag reflex, apneic patient, not breathing effectively, unconscious patient, altered patient, all those things. But there's a time when those simple BLS airways just don't work. And here's three reasons down here at the bottom of the page. So the first one is called intractable vomiting or bleeding. This is the patient who has just a volcano of vomit and a volcano of blood coming out of their mouth. And there's so much vomitus and there's so much secretions, you just can't keep up with it with just, with this just suctioning. And you can see if you insert a King airway and you seal the esophagus, and you seal the oral pharynx with, with, the, with the balloons that you inflate, you've basically isolated out the trachea so all those secretions can't get into the trachea and thereby into the lungs. 
also again if you if you if you take away that mask issue if you have a patient who's grossly obese and the masks just don't fit or you have someone with major you know deformities to their face or major facial trauma where you just can't get a good seal this takes care of that problem by taking the seal now it's internal it's inside their mouth rather than on their face and because these devices are so effective and efficient and because they, they provide us the ability to, to provide our ventilations much more effectively, if we encounter a patient with bronchospasm from an asthma attack or a bronchospasm or upper airway restrictions due to like allergic reaction or some kind of trauma, um, this extra pressure we can get through this device will help us overcome that resistance in the airway and help us ventilate the patient somewhat effectively. Now, there are a number of contraindications. Uh, the first one I already mentioned, they have to have no gag reflex. They also have to be taller than, or four feet or taller, should I say. If they, for some reason, either on purpose or by mistake, uh, drank some type of like Drano or battery acid or pool acid or you know, whatever they might have, might, have, might have had, those substances uh, will erode the esophagus. And if you place the King airway into the esophagus, as you're pushing it into the esophagus, that extra pressure could actually rupture the esophagus because it's already been weakened by this, this caustic substance. So that's a contraindication. Uh, there's a, a condition called esophageal varices, and this is seen primarily in patients who have liver disease. So their liver is distended for one reason or another. We have these portal veins and they travel from the liver up along the esophagus and because of the, the liver disease these veins get very distended very swollen very weak very thin walled and they're very fragile so again as you're pushing in that king airway and you're pushing it into the esophagus that pressure could rupture those blood vessels causing massive bleeding and of course if the person has a tracheostomy so they've got a you know trach tube or they got a stoma you already know how to deal with that and if someone you think, you know, they've got the pinpoint pupils and they got the needle in their arm and all that, and you're thinking, okay, this is a narcotic overdose. Well, we're gonna go the other way. We're gonna go with a BVM and a mask, and we're gonna go with a nasal pharyngeal airway and some Narcan and see if we can get them fixed just using that. Okay, let's uh, talk about the King airway in particular. So as you can see from the picture, uh, this is what comes in the packaging. When you open it up, it's going to have a syringe. It will have the, de the size device that you, you know, you've picked and a packet of KY jelly or some kind of water-based lubricant. What's nice about these devices, they're rather simple to use. They have one inflation port. That's that little kind of white wire that's coming off the side with the blue tip. That's where the syringe fits into and you push that air in, causing the balloons to inflate. Pretty straightforward with that. And it, it also inflates both cuffs simultaneously. There's one ventilation port for the BVM. So when this thing is properly inserted into the patient and you've inflated the balloons, you're gonna take off the mask from the BVM device and place the BVM bag directly onto that red cap right there. You'll ventilate the patient through that tube. Air is gonna come down the tube and it's gonna come out between these two balloons and go directly into the, into the trachea, thereby causing the chest to rise and fall. It's a pretty simple device, pretty easy to use. Um, it, uh, it does only work in the esophagus. Uh, obviously, if this thing were to be inadvertently placed into the trachea, you would block the person's ability to breathe. So again, know these sizes, uh, size three, size four, and size five. So size three is four to five feet uh, tall patients. Size four is five to six foot. And then size five is over six feet tall. For the size three, you use 50 milliliters of air uh, to inflate the balloons. You use 70 and then 80 for the, the size five. The equipment you're gonna need to perform this skill is you're gonna need all three sizes of your King Airway because you, you, you never know, you might have to go up or down a size possibly. Your tube tamer, which is that blue thing, that clamping device that will hold the tube in place once you've properly inserted it. You'll have your syringe, KY jelly, your cervical collar, a suction unit, bag valve mask, and airway adjunct. And of course, you'll have your end tidal carbon dioxide detectors. 
So I'm not going to get too deeply into the skill itself uh, because we're, you're going to have a video to watch and I'm going to demonstrate it before you do your testing process anyway. But the first thing I want to do after scene safety and BSI and all that stuff is I'm going to have my partner ventilate my patient with 100% oxygen with a BVM and an OPA. The idea is I want to hyper oxygenate the patient. I want to saturate this person's tissues with oxygen because there's going to be a period of time where when I'm going through the intubation process, they're not going to be breathing at all. Uh, while they're doing the oxygenation for me, I'm going to check my stuff out, inflate my balloons. I'm going to uh, lubricate my device and all that. And then I want to place the person's head in a neutral or sniffing position. Remember, our goal is not going into the trachea. Our goal is going into the esophagus. And if you do a complete full head tilt chin lift, um, that actually aligns the airway with the trachea. I want to go into the esophagus. So we're going to keep that head neutral, sniffing kind of position. You're going to grab the lower jaw and tongue with your thumb and forefinger, and you're going to lift that, that, that tongue and jaw up out of the way while you're inserting the device. So you slid it down into the person's anatomy, and you're going to slide it all the way down until the colored flange touches their teeth or gums. You'll then inflate the balloons to the prescribed amount of volume of air. And then you put the BVM on the red cap right there, and you're going to ventilate the patient. As you're ventilating the patient, you want to find what I call the sweet spot. Remember, there is a ventilation port in the device between the two blue balloons. And I want to pull that device out slowly until the hole in the device aligns up with their trachea. And that gives you optimal ventilation, optimal compliance, the best rise and fall that you can get. Once you have that sweet spot, then you need to confirm your placement. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to check abdominal sounds. This kind of sounds a little counterintuitive, but they're the easiest sounds to hear. And literally in one breath, uh, you can tell whether or not you're in the right place. So if you were to have inadvertently placed this into the trachea and inflated the balloons, as you're ventilating, the air is going to come out the device and go down into the stomach and you're going to hear gurgling or bubbling sounds. So in one breath, you'll hear blah, 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 blah sound. You know immediately you're in the wrong place. You'll then deflate the balloons, you pull out the device, and then you'll reintubate the patient a second time. So hopefully you'll hear no sounds. Uh, negative ep uh, epigastric sounds are a good thing. Second verification process is lung sounds. You know, make sure you have some lung sounds. Make sure you have rise and fall of the chest with each breath. That's positive. That's great. The third and final is going to be verification of the presence of carbon dioxide. Remember, the lungs are the only organ that can secrete carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. So this is a quantitative, uh, objective way of saying, yes, I am breathing through the lungs because I'm getting the person's air out of their lungs through my device. Um, this little plastic thing you see in the screen, this is called an easy cap, or they may call it a color metric device. And it comes out of the packaging new, it comes out purple. And in the presence of, car presence of carbon dioxide passing over this paper, it turns it away from purple to another one of those other colors you might see there on the rim of the, of the device. So you, you'll need two of these for each intubation, once initially and then once final just before arriving at the hospital. Just to give you a little better uh, view of this EasyCap device, you can see on the rim of the different colors and each one has the numeric value. Remember, color is subjective and that's why you want to report both the color and the numeric value so there's no confusion or miscommunication. And again, this fits between the BVM and the advanced airway. Now, for some reason, you are having difficulty inserting the King Airway. Uh, some of the problems you can encounter is, one, the balloons can be torn by various types of things. One would be broken teeth, jagged teeth. Uh, maybe they have some type of uh, dental appliance in, in their mouth that's been damaged and there's wires that are broken free. These all can, you know, cause the balloons to deflate. So just be careful about that. If as you're in as you're uh, inserting the device into the person, 
If you do feel a lot of resistance, try redirecting it slightly, try rocking it slowly side to side, maybe grab the tongue and jaw, lift it a little further out to get more room to get it in. Worst case scenario, remove it, add some more lubricant and then try it again. And of course, you know, you can always try a smaller tube if, if maybe you're, you know, have one size smaller available. There's this particular situation where sometimes uh, there'll be difficulty finding that sweet spot. This especially happens with spontaneously breathing patients. So you have a patient who's breathing ineffectively, very slowly, weakly, but they're still breathing on their own. Once you have this device properly placed, you pulled it back to that optimal sweet spot and all that, but you're still not getting good ventilations. It's probably because their epiglottis, uh, every time they take a breath in themselves, the epiglottis gets sucked up and covers the trachea. So one of the ways to fix this is you're going you're gonna to push the King Airway one or two centimeters deeper than you previously had. And what will happen, the, the balloon will trap the epiglottis and prevent it from doing that bad thing, obviously. So once you have this thing properly placed, you've fixed all the problems, you can now uh, secure it. So you get your tube tamer in place. You can see in the picture right there, make sure that clamp is tightened down so it holds the tube in place. You place a cervical collar on the patient, whether it's a medical patient or a trauma patient, it doesn't really matter. We, we have the collar to keep the head neutral so it doesn't flop around as we're moving the patient. And like with this uh, photograph at the bottom, this person is in full spinal motion restriction. Let's say you, that's your patient and you're driving to the hospital, to the trauma center, and in route to the hospital, you determine this patient could benefit from an advanced airway. Uh, the proper way to do this is have your partner hold their head uh, manually. You release the tape, the straps, you release the collar, you go through your, your intubation process, you secure it, you verify it, you put the tube tamer on, put the collar back on, put the tape back on, and as long as your, your partner has held the person's head throughout the, the, the whole process, then they've never left spinal motion restriction. Now, once you have all this information, everything has been done, you need to report lead SD. Uh, this stands for lung sounds. Obviously, you'd want to report present lung sounds. If you reported absent lung sounds, you probably want to fix that. Uh, you want to report your entitled carbon dioxide detection device. That's the E. Uh, get the color and numeric value. You want to report abdominal sounds, present versus absent. If you heard gurgling over the epigastrum, of course, you already know, you'd pull out the tube, you'd reinsert it. So you should always be reporting absent abdominal sounds. Um, these devices have centimeter hash marks labeled on the back of the clear plastic barrel. And so when you insert this into the person's anatomy and you pull it back out and find that sweet spot, you're going to see where the teeth align with these centimeter marks and you're going to report that depth like 12 centimeters, 14 centimeters, whatever the number might be. And of course, you're also going to report the size you used on the patient. The last D, the documentation, is to remind us to document lead SD at least twice on every single uh, patient care report. And of course, you're going to have to report this over the radio to the radio nurse en route to the hospital. So every time you move the patient, so the patient's on the floor, you intubate them on the floor, you move them from the floor to the gurney, the gurney to the ambulance. Every time you move the patient, you should reconfirm at the very least rise and fall of the chest, lung sounds, and belly sounds. Make sure that the tube hasn't moved. You can check your hash marks. You can, you know, it was, it was 12 at the teeth initially. Make sure it's still 12 at the teeth. It's another way of doing it as well. Uh, and then just prior to offloading at the hospital, before, before you open the back doors of the ambulance to exit, you're going to do one more complete SD lead, including another easy cap uh, of the uh, end title check as well. Even this, even this patient does not get transported. If they wind up getting pronounced at scene and they're going to go to the coroner's office, you need to leave everything in place and do a final SD lead or lead SD before you hand the patient over to the police officers or coroner. Um, there are some times when people who are intubated, they do get better. 
and they do start to wake up and become more aware and they feel this thing in their throat and they're going to try to pull it out. Uh, you're going to have to restrain their arms with soft restraints and you're going to have to call the base hospital and, and tell them what's going on and they could get could give you you know an order for extubation possibly. They probably will tell you just to restrain them and bring them in. It really depends upon how you know how far away you are from the hospital at that particular time. But if the if the device fails, if the balloons deflate or something breaks, you can take the device out on standing order and put a new one in on standing order uh, without having to call anybody. Once you are at the hospital, um, you're probably going to go into what's called a code room, and that's where like a CPR is go into, or really critical medical patients go into, or you're going to go to the trauma room for the trauma patients. You're going to have a doctor there, and what I usually do is when I wheel my patient in on the gurney, before I move the patient from my gurney to their bed, I, I ask the doctor, hey doc, could you come over and check my tube for me? The idea behind this is, is that if, if I allow them to move my patient in the process of moving them, the tube could become dislodged. And then there's no way I can verify that the tube was ever properly placed. And so if the doctor can, will come over and check your tube, and they don't have to, this is purely a courtesy you know, on their part. Uh, if they don't, then don't argue with them, say fine, just be careful moving the person from the gurney to the bed. Uh, what I always do is because there's recording devices in those in those code rooms and in those trauma rooms, I verbalize my my SD lead or my lead SD. Hey doc, I got a size three King Airway. It's 12 at the teeth. I got negative epigastric sounds. I got positive lung sounds, and my end title is 5.0 in yellow. I'm not. He's not really listening, <laughs> but I know the, the tape recorders are listening, so that's been documented. Once you turn the patient over to the doctor, the nurse will probably sign your patient care report for you. So lastly, maintaining accreditation. So you need to keep, pretty obviously, you need to keep your EMT certification current, your BLS CPR card current. You will have, of course, already completed this course and have a certificate of completion. And you will, of course, be employed by a PAA provider. So this person provides this service. And then once you are employed by a PAA provider. Um, it's their job to provide you with updated continuing education issues, as well as retesting you every six months on whatever device they might be using. And donuts? No donuts.